And here we have Randy, a uh, senior UX quantitative researcher, and he's going to talk about solving the problems in front of you. Randy, I'm going to be talking about solving the problems in front of you. Um, so a couple of details about myself. I am a quantitative UX researcher at Google. I know that is not a common job title. Not very many companies have it. The TLDR is that we are, quant UX researchers are data people who want to understand people. We use data science methods, social science methods, and to, to look at data, look at what people so that we can understand what people want for their products, how they're using those products, and then hopefully we take that information, give it to engineers and product people so that they can build better products, right? Um, some, and the interesting part is because we are a research organization, we're not a data science organization, we tend to do things that are a bit esoteric, I suppose you would want to say. We need to collect weird bits of data sometimes, for example. If we have to build a, if we need a specific kind of survey collection data system, if we can't sweet talk an engineer to like build the thing for us, we wind up building it ourselves. So we have a mix of guys who do survey stuff, serious like survey research from academia, and we have data scientists folk who are like maintaining you know, like engineering pipelines for our data collection processes. And there's a really big mix of skills in our group, right? So prior to Google, I spent 10 years doing startups around New York City. The relevant part is that I was a data person of some sort, either an analyst or engineer. Back then, data scientist wasn't a title yet. And the size of the companies were tiny. It's like 25, 100. The biggest was about 120, 150. Um, this will be slightly relevant as we go along with the talk. But anyways, today, I want, to think, I want you to ask, ask you guys to think about some big problems you've worked on. Right? Like, you know, we need a single source of truth for data. Uh, we, want, you know, we need a data model for collecting some stuff. Someone please build me a data warehouse, build a reporting system, right? Just think about what you feel about when you embarked or finished one of these products. Right? I don't know, how would you describe that? Just think about that. I would call it painful. That's what comes to my head, right? Slow, conflicting requirements. I'm not sure what I'm doing when I'm doing these projects. There's obviously too much choice, and I'm probably the nicest thing I could say was that mistakes were made and overcome. Right? Like that's how I feel when I'm doing these things. Big projects are hard, all right, and we tend to make them harder for ourselves, all right. So Donald Knuth, a uh, famous uh, you know data like not data scientist, computer scientist, who in the 70s before couple years before he inflicted tech on all of grad students around the world, he wrote this paper saying premature optimization is the root of all evil. It's actually, the paper is structured programming with go-to statements back in the 70s. But I took it out, this, you know, this is a very famous adage amongst programmers and people who work with computers that premature optimization is bad. But then like, <laughs> the last line, like the part that's not uh, after I'll highlight there, yet we should not pass up our opportunities for that critical 3%. Just kind of like just throws it out there. And then like doesn't tell you pretty much how to identify this 3%, right? It's just like, there's like gold here. We shouldn't do the bad stuff, but we should do, like, it's hard to do, right? So when we think about optimization, yes, there's a technical term for optimizing, and it has, you know, a lot of things going on with it, but in the common usage of it, right, we have, it's about like making stuff like better as in a, making an existing thing go faster, making the existing thing more efficient, right? It's not about, you don't really think about optimizing as when I'm dreaming up something to build, I'm optimizing. That's not something that we do, right? It's, but optimizing happens at the start of design, right? Think about all the times you're envisioning how something works. You're going from a not working state, right, where something is infinite runtime because it's never working, and you're going to a finite runtime working state, right? That is some form of optimization, right? You can imagine that picking the right algorithm matters, right? You know that I probably shouldn't be using bubble sort for whatever it is I'm doing, right? That is the design decision to make sure that you don't use that. You're not even gonna try bubble sort. You know it's bad, right? But that's the design decision. That's an optimization right there, right? So optimization is both required, right? And yet we're warned not to do it. It's not, you can't just say don't optimize because then you're gonna be using bubble sort all the place and you know that's bad. But where do you draw this line, right? Like the art is to know when to stop optimizing. It's not that you can't, you shouldn't do it because you obviously have to do it. Just where do we stop? 
right? So now, there's a lot of reasons to do optimization up front. I'm sure you can sympathize with this. We've all been bad, like hit the bad systems, right? Like the back end, that's like five databases that, you know, been glued together. The repurposed database field, right? The name has not changed, but it's now like, you know, that integer is now a bit field. I know if I have an engineer in my head that I'm cursing right now, because he did that to me. And my SQL has bitwise operators because of him. Uh, you know, that JSON field in the database that has like eight megabytes of text in it now. <laughs> Those people who have, we just use Excels for that, right? And now, what are you gonna do, right? We don't want to build the next system that everyone laughs at, right? I don't want to. But if I build a system, I'm gonna bet money that 10 years down the road, someone's either gonna laugh at it or wanna burn it to people like the ground, right? We don't wanna be that person. It's kind of just part of how we want to be respected as practitioners. Uh, we are supposed to learn from others, right? There are any topic you can think of. Someone's probably thought about it, built it, wrote something about it somewhere, either in academia, a million blog posts. Vendors would love to tell you how they're solving the problem, right? The thing is that like, when I'm doing this, I'm not an expert on this. Like, we're in the Microsoft building right now. I work at Google. I'm pretty sure like, in one of these buildings, the world expert, the person who wrote the textbook on whatever problem it is that I'm working on, is somewhere here. I don't know where that person is. I don't know who that person is. In theory, I should find them and ask them about my really simple data warehouse project, and they would probably be happy to help, and yet I would feel really bad about wasting their time on my really simple thing, right? So, but I'm supposed to do this as a you know, good practitioner. This is like it's supposed to be, I'm supposed to learn from the mistakes of others, right? So, and then fixing the mistakes that I do make seems really hard, really expensive, right? Like, I've got to admit that I screwed up somewhere, right? If I, you know, made a data warehouse and the performance is one query per minute, that's probably bad. I'm gonna have to, someone's gonna complain about that. Everyone who depends on my really slow data warehouse, their, all their work is gonna get thrown away if I throw away my data warehouse design, probably, right? There's a lot of wasted time and resources all the, and then fixing it will take even more resources to fix, hopefully, and there's no guarantee that the fix will actually work, right? Like if I designed a really bad system, do you trust me to build another system that's better than the one I just made that's bad? Like, I don't know, right? There's no guarantees. And most importantly, why, we, why do we optimize early on? It's because we feel really, really smart when we do it right, right? Like, past me usually just gives me problems, right? <laughs> Like, I, like when the rare occasion when Pasty does something really well, I feel really, really good about that. And it only happened maybe once or twice in my entire life. But I still remember that, right? <laughs> so this is probably why, right? Like, you know, the one time that Pasty gave me that good data warehouse, I'm gonna like them. Okay, so anyways, an example is just so we have something concrete to talk about. It's like, okay, imagine we're building a big old data warehouse, right? Business wants that single source of truth that emoji is doing a lot of lifting right now. Um, we've got a production database of some sort. There's vendors that are giving us nightly CSVs, because of course they are. Um, right? And there's an FTP server in there, right? Like, yeah. Um, we've got a lot of logs in this like Hadoop cluster here. The formats vary <laughs> for, for reasons undisclosed, right? And then uh, you know, a couple of executives have some very important Excel files. <laughs> dot slash final v2, right? Okay, so I'm sure all of you immediately have opinions and options, right, that you're thinking about, right? What are we, what are we gonna do with this situation, right? Like, do we keep using Hadoop? Do we, do we go to the cloud and go, one of the various vendors in there? Do we just buy a really, really big database and just like ignore all the other things going on, right? Like, and then you're thinking about, like, how do I move data around? It's like, what, what's going on with the ETL? Do I need DAGs? You know, do I need availability, right? Yes, no, I don't know. Like, what performance do I actually need, right? All these questions are going around in your head, and they all have solutions, but then they, they raise more questions, they raise more constraints. There's just, it's just so much going on, right? So, so what do you actually build? What's going on? And then, you know, you ask anyone, it's like, it depends, right? That's like the internet answer to anything. It's like, well, if you have a complex problem, it depends, right? Like, what is it that you, like, it just, goes right back, right? Like, what is the design that I need for my unique situation? No one will be able to tell you that, and that's it. <laughs> You're just left there trying to think, right? It, like, this answer is great for, for talks, it's great for putting things on, things on the internet, but it doesn't work for you, right? So what do you do? You have to launch something, 
right? So like, all right, I gotta design something. And I still looked up like system design process, and then I don't, I don't understand any of this. Like, how do you design a system? Is like itself the whole design project here apparently, um, right? Like, there are stages. Some are in, some are cyclical and some are linear. I don't. Some have flowcharts going all sorts of directions. I don't know what's going on. So you're like, all right, well, I gotta design something that's be you know very rational about this, right? Get get requirements. Look at my options. Eliminate the ones that don't work. Right? Pick the design. You know, you prove that thing works. Make a prototype, and then like we build the thing, right? It's like reasonable. It doesn't seem crazy. And then I've been talking about this in the generic thing sense, right? But like, you know, if you work in an enterprise, if you work in a company that's let's say more than 500 people, essentially all this is like hard. There's a hard mode to it, right? You got more people, which means more constraints, more stakeholders. More meetings, <laughs> more requirements coming out of the meetings. You got more approvals because people want to sign off on things, right? You got a lot more bike sheds to paint, right? You got, there's a lot more politics involved, money. You would think that you know a giant megacorp, resources. You got more resources. This is supposed to be a good thing, but now you have more options, right? Like you, you like as a startup, you don't have the budget to buy that one million dollar database. Well. At a large, large, large company, you actually have an option. You have to sit down and think: Should we actually buy this extremely expensive thing? Right? You have to consider building versus buying in the sense that, well, we actually have really smart engineers. Do I want to devote all their salary and time to building a custom system for our own needs versus buying something off the shelf? It becomes like a decision that you can make, and therefore you have to at least consider it. Right? It just makes things worse. It doesn't make, like, resources don't really make things better, <laughs> right? So, I can't figure out, at least in, inside my head, where the line is between designing, right, all the stuff we were talking about, and over-designing, which is still the same stuff that we were talking about, right? You've been rational about it, like, you, you know, none of the things that, the steps you've laid out, the things you're concerned we're trying to address, are, are, like, something you would flag as, okay, we just skip this step. It doesn't seem reasonable to say that about any of the things we're doing. Right? You've got, so you know, you sit down, you have like tables, you have notes, you've got all sorts of things trying to compare A versus B versus C. Right? You're reading papers, you're talking to people, you're asking people what's going on, you're sketching out things, and then it all seems like you're just doing design work, right? But then three weeks have kind of passed. <laughs> you just stand up and <laughs> progress are you going? Well, I read this book, I've got five more books here, and this is, like, don't look at my Amazon because i got more coming. Like, it's getting a little awkward. Right? So, and then like you've got the what if questions, but, like the big questions, like, what if, you know, we scale, right? We go web scale, you know, for the people old enough to get that joke. Um, what if, you know, it's not fast enough for that? Should, someone's going to ask, are we going to move to the cloud? And you're going to have to have an answer for them, right? <laughs> And then like, okay, well imagine if we got this, if we somehow did all this work, got a perfect data warehouse working, what are the future use cases, right? I have to now imagine like a business unit that doesn't exist and what they're gonna do with my thing, like, ugh, <laughs> right? So, and you're also thinking about like, what's going on with the schema, right? Like, all right, I got tables everywhere, I gotta like manage all the keys bouncing around, I've got like, you know, figuring out what do I bring over from the legacy stuff and what's redundant. How do I do that? Like, do I pre-compute aggregations or not? Like, there are opinions about cubes, right? Like, schema changes, like, are we gonna allow them? Not allow them? Do we care? Is it NoSQL, SQL? How are we gonna do that? There's a lot of things going on with partitioning that I don't even understand, right? And I'm sure someone here in this building does, right? <laughs> so, you know, what are the signs that you're starting to optimize a little bit too early, right? Like, you've got too many options and you start hit this point where you're like, I can't even tell. A, like, these all look good enough and I don't know anymore. And you just hit that wall. And you, you, you start realizing, it's like, wait, I, I'm going in a circle here. I've, like, read 10 more blog blah, posts about this thing and I'm still coming to the same decision that these two things are similar enough. What do I do, right? Um, you're accounting for situations that are become increasingly unlikely. Like, yeah, you know, if I'm doing like a personal web server project, I'm probably not gonna get to the point where I have 20 million visitors a, a day. That's probably not likely. But if I'm planning for that, I'm probably over, over designing, right? And another sign is like your core design, like the way the architecture is kind of hanging onto itself, 
it hasn't changed very much. I'm just like evaluating, should I swap this little thing in? Should I just add a load balancer here? What happens if I you know, mix around with the network a little bit? Like, that probably shouldn't matter at the design phase, right? You kind of realize like, oh, things are starting to look like a waterfall here, right? Um, this was taken out of zoo. I found it in my archives, and it just happened to have a tiger in there. I was like, oh, this is perfect, perfect photo <laughs> for this. <laughs> like, right? But I'm proposing that you know you guys collectively know of another extreme of designing, yeah. right? Like hackathons. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Like I'm gonna do a slide here. Don't ever, ever, ever put <laughs> the production database in a hackathon. It's probably not a good idea. You will get exactly what you pay for in that situation. But if you're gonna try, tell me about it so I can learn from it. Right? So hackathons. We can learn from the notion of hackathon. I'm not saying we design to a hackathon, but I'm saying we can learn about how to run things with one. Right? So you know, think about a hackathon. There are tight enforced deadlines, right? There's time pressure, a huge amount of time pressure. And it forces you to shove a lot of research and design off of your plate. Right? You're like, I, I don't have I have five days to do this thing, or I have one day to do this thing. I can only read so much because I have to write code. So you, you just pay that cost later. You're like, I'm gonna slap down something and hope that it works, right? You start, you stop thinking, you implement, and the deadline is completely arbitrary and it's not scaled to the difficulty of the project, right? Like, think about it, like a normal deadline, you're like, oh, it'll take me X number of days to do this thing, you make an estimate. It's scaled to how hard you think it is. Like, hackathons don't care, <laughs> right? They're like, you got a week, whatever you get, you get. Right? No matter how, like, whether it's like flying on rockets on the moon or like building a website, you got a week. Right? <laughs> this is actually a good thing, like because it is a hard time box. Right? There are you know effectively zero expectations. Right? Like you know you're gonna cut corners. Right? Like you've seen hackathon projects where like the the final thing, like the back end data, is like all hand typed as like over my desperately because they don't have time to do the ML part of it. Right? Like yeah, corners are being cut. There's no elegant designs in there, the performance expectations are practically zero, right? You don't expect to scale because you're gonna throw this code away anyway. Right? So, you know, you what like it's okay to throw away the code in this situation, right? You keep the knowledge of building the code. You don't have to like worry about, you know, a lot of details, and then you can find the problems that you didn't think about, right? Like all the times remember you're like implementing something and you're like, oh I, I need this abstraction I didn't think about. I need like 20 more libraries. Oh, this Linux distribution is just not working for me. Not stuff you think about, but it gets in your way, right? But like, think about how much better you, you are at the next project because you hit all these road bumps in this little throwaway project, right? And it's okay if it works, and it's okay if it fails, right? The stakes are low, so people don't care about your hackathon project, and you're gonna learn something. So, what I'm saying is, is like you should solve the problems in front of you when you're kind of doing these large, scary projects, right? Kind of like as if you were in a hackathon because you're only solving the immediate problems, right? I need a database right now. I'm gonna go grab the, the most easy to install one off the shelf and pop it down. I'm going to get a web server. I'm just gonna get the most bog standard thing and slap it down and connect my two things and hopefully I have a web app going, right? Like, as the complexity comes, you're solving it. You're not really thinking that far ahead, right? You are time boxing your exploration, right? The making failure viable means that, yeah, if I didn't consider this use case, that's okay. It'll fail, but that's fine. The naive solution kind of works, right? Uh, and you, you know, you're handling the clear requirements, right? It just cuts down on those like choices, right? Like no one at a hackathon is going to go buy a hundred million dollar database, they, like the purchasing process would go beyond the week anyway, right? So it just makes it easier, right? You're just throwing things away until you get to something that kind of works, right? And then you should also handle the obvious follow-ups, right? Like, okay, fine, we have a data warehouse now. It is functioning kind of as in intended. I know that people are going to use it for this one use case that we haven't programmed in yet because they keep asking us, right? So like, the scope is not just exactly what people tell you they wanted to do, it's just, okay, a little bit beyond that to the things that are you anticipate are really, really going to happen, right? It's just a way to hint at yourself that I should leave some flexibility, I shouldn't just build exactly to the plans. There's gotta be a little bit of room there because this thing will grow. And then 
You should think about processes as functions. For a lot of these design things, right, you should chunk your designing just like you would chunk your code, right? It's like you should have separation of concerns so that, hey, X passes something to B. If you can make it so that there's some abstraction that you can just pass things along without thinking about it, then your design is that much more flexible. If, you, if one piece, if that database piece doesn't work, you can rip the database piece out, put some other database piece in that kind of has the same interface and expect it to kind of work, right? Like having everything glued together in a monolith is probably a bad idea. And then you should expect to rebuild things, right? Like the throwaway hackathon code. Well, you know, building something the second time around usually is so much better than the, than the first time. Some people I know, they actually actively throw, like when they, when they plan on building a project, they will think about building it and then just automatically throwing away the first one. It's like writing a paper, the first draft is always garbage, right? You, the, the, a lot of writers, they say that the value of writing comes in, in the rewrite of that first draft because you get all your ideas down, you finally see the structure of it, but now you can kind of like take a knife to it, rip out all the extraneous parts, put in all, emphasize all the good parts, right? And so you also have to remember that results are grown over time. I like to pick on this, if you go to any cloud provider, I work at Google Cloud, so I get to pick on Google Cloud, uh, and you add, look up their architecture for building a website, you'll get something like this, something extremely complex. I know AWS has an extremely complex one, I'm pretty sure Azure has one also. Right? If you think about it, a web server, the minimum you need is one machine connected to the internet, just running Apache, right? basic install. But then why is it that there's an app engine on here? Why is there CDNs and, and cloud and blob storage? Why is there caching going on? Why is there logging going on? All of these were bolted on for specific use cases, but I'm pretty sure that like, they weren't added on just because it was specified in some best practice thing. They serve a purpose, right? Like I need logging because I want something. If I don't care about that aspect of logging, if I don't care about you know metrics or or understanding bugs or whatever, if I just want my website to be on there and I don't care about anything else, then logging doesn't need to be on there, right? So it's okay to like re refactor architectures because like list architecture didn't grow up over time, like you know overnight. Then I'm gonna ask you to have faith in your future self, just like how past me gives present me all sorts of problems. You're going to be giving future you problems, but you should have faith in that you're able to solve it. Think about all the clever hacks that you've done with, with databases, right? Like, oh, you found a clever way to squeeze out that much extra information um, with like, you know, using uniques or a fancy little join or some fancy little logic so that you can get that answer for like analytics that you normally would not expect out of your existing database, right? Like, that will happen to your system. You just have to have faith that you can solve that problem when it becomes concrete and you can do it. And that's it for my talk. You can find me on these places. I write a newsletter where every week I talk about, write about um, mundane data science topics kind of like this. And yeah, if you guys have comments, uh, just want to share stories about horrible things, <laughs> I'm more than happy to talk about them. Thank you guys. Yeah, I just love the trench coat part, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Randy. All right, thank you guys. And then if, you, if you guys have any questions, please raise your hand and then you can ask me a question. Yeah, do you take your own advice? <laughs> <laughs> I try, but then like my advice is like, to YOLO it, essentially. <laughs> and so I do try, but I, like, the hard part is like remembering to try, right? Like, I forget, like, because it's so easy to just fall into the over-design phase, right? So, but like, there's, some point, uh, there's a point where internally I'm like, all right, I'm getting frustrated at this. I, I need to just do it. And then, uh, you know, set an artificial deadline to myself and just do it, that helps, or at least for me. Yeah? With all the voices coming in, there's, there's the um, perennial one, there's what about AI? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find like anything in particular drives that like 
desire to over design when you're like falling into that? Ah, uh, I think it's because all of us as data people have really good imaginations. We, we see a lot of crazy things happening on the world. For example, if, we, if I tell you that I'm going to put a text box on the internet and it's put into a database, you're, you're all imagining horrible stories right now. I'm pretty <laughs> sure about that, right? Like, right? We've seen it. And, and so because of that, we want, to, we want to stop it. Like, we want to put validation in there. We want to make sure like, our database doesn't explode because someone puts like, a million bytes into a, a thing. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why we over, like, but it's hard, it's, it's hard for us to like, know when to stop, right? Because it's just like, we imagine all the scenarios. They all seem extremely common because we've seen examples of them, and that <coughs> throws us into a bias where it's like, wait, I probably don't care if this database falls over because it's only you know, a Tor project. I should just let that go. It's it's okay, right? And that's really hard to tell someone who's in, like likes to cross all the T's and dot all the I's. <laughs> so, anyone else? All right. Thank you guys.